Hello there ladies and gentlemen, my name is Mildra, and I'll be your Gaming Monk for the evening. Time can certainly change one's opinions on things for a myriad of reasons. A few years ago, I said I had a very strict, no D&D 5e attitude, and while I stuck to that to the most part, I've slowly shifted to minimizing any talk about first party material within the alleged world's greatest role playing game. Of late, I've pivoted to a frustration with how its company, Wizards of the Coast, has been lax when it comes to supporting alternate modes of play or alternative mechanics within 5th edition, instead banking on third party and fans to fill in their gaps. In this specific instance, it ties to campaign settings getting official support, which is why I defended people who were upset with the release of Explorer's Guide to Wildemont. It's less to do with the material in the book, I'm sure it's fine, and more to do with the optics. Given the swath of settings that have either been given lip service at best or outright ignored, the ironic thing is that a generation ago, this wasn't as much of an issue, with support going from Dark Sun to Spelljammer, in all but name, and Eberron, as well as the subject of today's review, Gamma World. Now, Gamma World is a long-running RPG that can be best described as science fantasy meets post-apocalypse. Originally published in 1978, Gamma World has gone through many owners and origins, some being rooted in AD&D's mechanics, others in the color-coded tables from Marvel Facerp, and in this review, we'll be looking at the 7th edition, released in 2010, that integrated mechanics from D&D 4th edition and the controversial collectible card-based approach. How does it hold up? Well, let's find out. Gamma World 7th Edition was released in a box set instead of a traditional book. As such, it's presented more like a rule book you'd find in a board game at around 161 pages. Much of the book's design carries the design ethos present in D&D 4th Edition, that being a magazine-like style with less emphasis on the tome-like structure that was in its predecessor. The only thing I'm not a fan of is this insistence on having text in some form of Dutch angle or some sort of tilt. It might give the game a messy vibe, but I feel there are better ways to accomplish this. In a way, it's a clean and dirty look at the same time. Now in most games, your character is one that the player has some concept and builds around, in the character creation steps. This is not one of those games. I will be exploring this with Jiro Yamada, and I'm approaching this with as little conceptualization as possible, and I sometimes fool myself into thinking I'm clever. First step is character origins, a package of advantages. Each grants a bonus to overcharge rolls on alpha powers that have a matching source, a critical bonus at higher levels, and a starting set of powers that is the equivalent of an Origins at Wills. Now in our case, we rolled an 8 and a 14 on the d20 rolls, so our primary is Gravity Controller and our secondary is Pyrokinetic. This grants us a plus 4 bonus to Athletics and Interaction, an Immunity to Falling Damage, 10 Fire Resistance, and adjacent enemies taking 5 fire damage when they end their turns within range, as well as two starting powers, Gravitational Pulse and Fiery Flare. Now second is Ability Scores, which is semi-random. The primary and secondary origins grant an 18 score to the former and a 16 to the latter. If both use the same ability score, then that ability score has a rating of 20. The rest are generated by a strict 3d6 roll. In our case, we rolled a 16, 15, 17, and 9. Assigning these, our final ability scores are Strength 15, Dexterity 17, Wisdom 16, Constitution 18, Intelligence 16, and Charisma 9. Step 3 is Skills. At character creation, skills are rooted in ability modifier and level, as well as three skills gaining a plus 4 bonus. Now two of these are from Origins, and the third is based on a random d10 roll. And we rolled a 4, so we gain a bonus to Insight. As a result, most of our skill modifiers are 4 with the exception of Athletics at a 7 and Insight at an 8. Now step 4 is Gear. The starting amount of gear is a melee weapon, a ranged weapon, armor, and an explorer's kit. Beyond that, there is a starting gear table that can be rolled. Using the starting gear table, you gain 1d4 plus 1 d20 rolls on that table. And we got a total of 5 rolls in this case. So our gear will be a heavy melee weapon, basically a stop sign, a heavy gun, a shotgun, heavy armor, explorer's kit, riding horse, climber's kit, night vision goggles, lantern, and a water purifier. Now step five is derived statistics, specifically hit points, defenses, initiative, and speed. In our case, we have 30 hit points, and thus a bloodied of 15, armor class 18, 
Fortitude 15, Reflex 16, Will 13, Speed 5, and Initiative 4. Lastly, we draw one random Alpha Mutation card and one Omega Tech card. For the former, we draw Phasing, which means that when we are hit with an attack, we can take half damage from attacks and ignore difficult terrain for one full round. This ability can be used once per encounter. Our Omega is a Force Shield, which grants us resist 20 to damage when we're hit with an attack. Since our Alpha is a Dark type, when we use it, we gain a plus 2 bonus to its Overcharge roll. Now, Gamma World's character creation can be best described as... D&D 4th Edition Light. A lot of the defenses, skill setups, and the leveling system isn't too far removed from 4th Edition, even with 10 levels instead of 30. The elephant in the room is going to be the card system, especially in an age of digital tabletop. And spoiler warning, this isn't the last time we're going to be going into that. Gamma World uses the 4th Edition version of the D20 system, and while there are no healing surges, Second Wind is still present. Your Origins may act as a class of sorts, as it provides a critical hit effect at 7th and 6th level, a utility power at 3rd and 7th, and a expert power at 5th and 9th level for the primary and secondary Origins, respectively. Combat works virtually the same as it did in 4th edition, minus the card thing. So let's talk about that. There are two types of cards, Alpha Mutations and Omega Tech. Each of these are in separate decks by players or GMs. Now, alpha Mutations are akin to Encounter Powers in 4th edition. You gain one Alpha card at 1st level, two at 4th level, and three at 8th level. These are drawn at the beginning of a session and are redrawn between encounters. In addition, when a natural 1 is rolled on an encounter, an Alpha Flux is triggered, causing that player to either discard a readied or used Alpha Mutation and redraw it from the appropriate deck. In the case of some cards, you have an extra effect known as Overcharge. This is a random D20 roll that is triggered after the effects of the Alpha Mutation and applies extra effects onto the player. Typically, this is a kind of and but roll where a 10 or higher is a positive effect and a 9 or less is a negative one. Omega Tech is more akin to magic items or artifacts in D&D, even having similar slot setups to those magic items. Now, if you're thinking of invoking Clark's Law with how Omega Tech works, you're not far off. Like Alpha Mutations, an Omega Tech can only be used once per encounter. But unlike them, you're not limited to a set number of readied ones. The repeated use of Omega Tech is not set in stone. When an Omega Tech card is used, you roll a charge check on a d20. On a 10 or higher, you can use the tech again. On a 9 or lower, the tech loses its charge and is discarded. However, some Omega Tech cards have a salvage entry, which allows a discarded Omega Tech to function at a reduced capacity as regular gear, so long as the player has a le level equal to the salvage rating. So if something has salvage 3, you can salvage it if you're third level or higher. Now, I focus so much on the Alpha and Omega cards because that's going to be the make or break for this system. In a way, it's similar to the Cyphers in the Cypher system, i.e. in Numenera, the Strange, and so on. It's a bit more reliable than the one-use affairs in that setup, but the booster pack design, along with its origins being of lesser impact, was the complete wrong way to do it. I don't like the reliance on mutations to be the source of most of player complexity since it means that the Origins run into a lesser version of the race problem that D&D had, where at higher levels, race matters less than class or feats or skills. I am not opposed to the idea of mixing card game mechanics with role-playing games. In fact, I encourage it. After all, people have clamored for a role-playing version of Magic for years, until Wizards of the Coast listened and everyone wished that they didn't. But I'm getting ahead of myself. Beforehand, I made the comparison with the Cypher system, but this card's setup comes in a pre-package. They opted to do it in the form of booster packs in Gamma World, the same way it would work with Magic. And these booster packs were expensive, I think they ran for about 11 bucks each. In addition, the core material was in boxes instead of a straight book. This also limited the amount of detail that the world of Gamma Terra can potentially have. The best we get is the faction setup within the expansion backs. I know 4th edition D&D was criticized as being a board game and not an RPG, but this does not do any favors because of the lighter books required of a box set. I don't like focusing on the card aspect because it takes away from the prospect of being an accelerated D&D 4th edition, which Essentials tried to be but kind of failed at it. Unfortunately, there's a better accelerated 4th edition called Heroes Against Darkness nowadays. And all in all, Gamma World 7th edition is underdeveloped. It remains an idea at its most charitable. It's one that in theory could work, but the execution brought it down. This needed a full core book instead of a box set, but I could see taking some of the ideas in this build of a card game RPG. But I can't review an idea. 
As such, Gamma World 7th Edition gets a stamp of caution. It's not bad per se, but it's a little too raw.